In my Bible, it's entitled God's Love and Ours, 1 John 4, 7 to 21. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So I said already this is the day that I've been simultaneously looking forward to and absolutely dreading. This is the last sermon I will preach until the 18th of September. And I have been agonizing all week. I have sweat blood. You know that sense. I'm not going to be speaking to you again now until September. So I need to say something meaningful and wonderful that you're going to take away with you forever and ever. And it's going to stay with you so that you don't forget me. And I don't come back in September and you go, sorry, are you new? <laughs> so what does God want to say to us this morning? I have genuinely been all over the place. Eventually, though, I settled on this, one of the most wonderful passages in the whole of the New Testament. A passage that tells us how much God loves us and then exhorts us to love one another, to live lives in response to the love that God pours out on us. Last week, we looked at the parable of the prodigal son, didn't we? And we heard again the invitation of God the Father to return to him, to be embraced in his love, to know that no matter what you have done, to know no matter where you have been, there is a place for you. Return to God because he loves you. And it's that simple message of love that is repeated here today. God loves you. It's actually the message, when you think about it, that's at the heart of the whole Bible. Why did God create you? Because he loves you. Why did he call you? Because he loves you. Why will he never leave you or forsake you? Because he loves you. Why did he come in the person of Jesus? Because he loves you. Why did he die for you? Because he loves you. But love isn't just something that God does. It is actually who he is. Verse 8 and verse 16 tell us that God is love. Before he is anything else, he is love. Love isn't just one part of his character. It is who he is at the very core of his being and everything else. His faithfulness, his patience, his mercy and his judgment comes from his deep, deep love. 
Never understood this, really, until I became a parent. But on that day when my children were born, I knew that I loved them with every single part of me. And there is absolutely nothing that they can do that will stop me from loving them. I might roll my eyes frequently. I do roll my eyes frequently. But it doesn't matter how wild they might get. It doesn't matter that they might fall off the rails. I might be hurt. I might be disappointed. I might be broken hearted. But I will walk to the ends of the earth for my children again and again and again and again because they are my children and I love them. But even that pales into comparison to how God, how much God loves them and how much he loves you and how much he loves me. But it's not enough for us to know about his love, is it? It's not enough, you know, so many of us, we go away and we say, oh yes, God loves me, yes. And it never gets from there to there. God doesn't want us to just know about his love. He wants us to experience it. Not just to understand it, but to live in it. So here's a question for you. I'm getting away with murder today. How do you know when someone loves you? How do you know when someone loves you? Come on. Give me some ideas. There must be someone who's been in love once in their life at some point on the floor. How do you know? Come on, give me some ideas. They tell you that they love you. Yeah? I'm now, you, you know how I think, don't, don't you, you, you know, you know that I think in songs now, usually bad 90s songs and 80s songs, and all that I've got going through my head now, do you remember that song, More Than Words? More than words. Look it up when you get home, it's brilliant. It's one of my soppy love songs. More than, I won't start singing it. It's one of, you know when you're in a gooey mood, it's one of those that you put on. It's one Adrian runs. So oh, she's got that music on again, I'm off. More than words, but God tells us he loves us. How else do we know? I'm not talking about God now, I'm talking about anybody. How do you know that the person that you are married to or the person that you are dating or the person that you are with or the person that you gave birth to or the person that gave birth to you, how do you know that they love you? So they tell you? They want to be with you. Are we talking about our children here? They're like, yeah. I suppose we ought to. It's been a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They want to spend time with you. Absolutely. They want to be with you. How else? Oh. Oh. You can see it in their eyes. That's really lovely. Find someone that loves you, looks at you like that, yeah. So um, how do you know when someone loves you? And some of us have a lot to put up with, don't we, Richard? You know, it's why the church just prays for Adrian constantly. So we know, yes, they put up with our bad habits anymore. They do things for us, yes, yes. You all need to start thinking about your love languages. How do you show love? How do you receive love? And start thinking about this and maybe start living this out a bit more. I thought, you know, it'd be, it'd be really quite easy. How do you, how would you show someone that you love them? And how would you choose to receive love? Maybe that's something to ponder and reflect on. I'm a gift giver. I'm a gift giver. I love someone. I give them things. I want to give them things. I want to... This is how much I love you, have some flowers. This is how much I love you, have chocolates. This is how much I love you, have something. I'm a gift giver, that's my love language. That's what I do. I'm a gift giver. I'm a hugger. I love you. Give me a hug, I need a hug. I need that physical, conscious, but you know, embrace of love that says I love you, that says, no matter how scary the world is, we've done it, we've got this together. Me and you against the world, we can do this. My children hug me, I hug everyone that I come into contact with, Adrian. Never used to like hugging, but he's had to learn. Um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. What's your lang love language? Cool, come on, it's not rocket science, is it? How do you know when 
someone loves you, how do you experience that love? I've put, oh, go on. Yeah, touch and feel and hugs. You're a hugger, same as me, aren't you? We nearly, when Linda and I hug, it's a, it's a worry that either of us is going to come away without broken ribs. We both, like, literally bear hug. And you come out, you go like, yep, I can still, yep, yep, that's fine, yep, yep. <laughs> but it's wonderful. I put you experience that love in the way they look at you. So I got that one. I feel like it's blankety blank. What is it? Celebrity squares. I put that one. Ding, ding, ding. We can cross that one out. Um, in the way they care for you. In the way they speak to you. And how they are faithful to you. We know that we are loved because we experience their love whether that's the love of a brother, a sister, a friend, a husband, a wife, a child, or a parent, we know that we are loved by God because we experience the love of God. Ephesians 3 verse 19 puts it like this. It's, it's the Apostle Paul writing to Ephesians and he prays, may you experience the love of Christ, though it is so great, you will never fully understand it. That's from the New Living Translation. May you experience experience the love of Christ though it is so great you will never fully understand it I just think that's wonderful Paul isn't talking there about academically knowing about God's love he isn't talking about understanding it so we can win intellectual and theological arguments he wants us to know and experience the love of God with everything that we are because that knowledge will be transformational. Transformational to us as people, transformational in our relationships with one another and with the rest of the world. Many of you know by now my deep, deep love of the seaside. I might have mentioned it once or twice. Um, I'm one of those weird people as well that loves swimming in the sea, right there, right out in the waves, swimming in the sea. It's just an incredible feeling, not all year round, I'm not one of those mad people. We're talking just in the summer. And we're talking not down at some park where there's goose poo. It's definitely the sea. Definitely only the sea. But there, you know, when you're swimming in the sea, one of the many reasons that the sea is so special to me is because it, it is, to me, such a picture of God's power and his might and also of his love. So many of us, it seems to me, we paddle on the edge of God's love. We dip our toes in, then run away, squealing. But God wants us to dive in, to be completely immersed in his deep, unending love, to rest in it, to be held in it, and to experience the fullness of it. But if we're honest, so many of us struggle with love, don't we? We're okay, we're good at loving others, but we're not so good at receiving love because we don't necessarily feel very lovable. Or we think we have to earn God's love. It's so um, entrenched in us that we have to earn stuff. Do you know the cake-making people? Is it Betty Crocker, the cake-making people? You know they do a cardboard box and you, you mix it up. Well, when they first launched Betty Crocker, they, they had this cake mix in a box. And all you had to do was add water, mix it up, bung it in the oven, Bob's your uncle. No one was buying these cakes. No one was buying them. So they did a bit of market research and figured out what the problem was. They took out the dried egg. Now, if you buy a Betty Crocker cake in a box, you have to tip out the, the stuff, you have to add water and an egg. And you beat it up and you make a cake and the cakes just sold and sold and sold, and now they are the biggest uh, sales and manufacturer of, of cakes. Um, incredible. Because people were saying, I can't just add water. I need to earn this cake. I need to add an egg. That's what I need to do. And that's what happened. We need to, it's so entrenched in us. And we put ourselves under all kinds of pressure. We try and enforce all kinds of rules and restrictions on ourselves. We try and add an egg. And when we trip up, we think that God is disappointed and angry with us because we are angry and disappointed with ourselves. And so, and I believe this is so vitally important, you need to know today that God loves you. 
you don't need to add an egg. He loves you just as you are. You are his precious child. He's not angry with you. He's not waiting for you to fall down so he can say, ha, look, you messed that up. Verse 18 says there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. So if today you're carrying around this idea of a God who is angry with you, a God who's watching your every move, waiting for you to make a mistake or trip up, and you're enforcing all of these rules and regulations on yourself, you need to know that God loves you. You are precious in his sight. And do you want to know how long he's loved you? Since before you were born. And he has loved you ever since but then for others love is frightening because we have a fear of rejection we've been rejected and hurt in the past by those who claim to love us or those who should have loved us maybe our parents maybe a partner a husband or a wife and so we carry those deep hurts those deep insecurities and that fear of rejection and we transfer that onto God We think, if I do something wrong, God will reject me. If I'm not a good enough Christian, God won't love me. Do you want to know how much God loves you? He loves you so much that he sent his only son to die for you so that you can live. And so that you can know what it is like to be truly loved and to live in and to experience experience that love of God because God loves everyone he loves everyone who's walked past the doors this morning he loves everyone who's still in their beds across the road this morning and God loves you this passage tells us actually uh, the author the apostle John who is the author of this letter he makes it clear And that actually we in turn, in response to the love that God has poured out on us, in response to the love that we receive, we have a responsibility to love others. As we live in the love of God, then we need to also live out the love of God. We have a responsibility to love others with God's love. Not to win some holy brownie points or to show off how godly we are but in response to the love that God has poured out on us. God loves us, so therefore we must love each other. Verse 11 and 12, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. In other words, it is through loving one another that we see God. We see God in each other. How incredible is that? And verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Our love is as a response to God's love. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So, okay, here's another question. How do we love one another? To put it a different way, to put it in the language that I used at the beginning of the sermon, how can I love you in a way that means you experience my love for you? You think about those things that we shared earlier. How can you know that I love you? How can I know that you love me? How can we experience that love? How can we as a church fellowship grow in that love? How can we, as followers of Jesus, looking round, don't like to break it to your church, but have a look round, these are your brothers and sisters. These are the people that God has brought you to worship with, to share with, to build up together, to do life with, and to love. How do we know that we are loved by each other? What can we do explicitly? What can we do outwardly to show that love so that it is visible? How can I love you like that? Well, I can pray for you. 
There's a simple one, isn't it? I can pray. Don't you get that sometimes when something happens, you think, well, all I can do is pray. If only we understood what God did when we pray, what power there is in prayer. I can pray for you. I can take time to ask you how you're doing. What's going on in your life? I can follow up with you. You know, last week you were going through this. How is it now? I can remember and take the time, actively listen to you and pray for you. I can choose to speak well of you. Uh, we had quite a hilarious moment last week. Could have been quite an interesting moment, couldn't it, Mark? Um, after the service last week, while we were sitting in here waiting for the barbecue, I'd kind of gone up onto the back row and was sitting talking to Emily and her mum um, because it was the last time that they were going to be here. Emily's now gone home from university. And there were people all around me talking. You know what it's like. I was mid-conversation and I heard my name. You know how you hear your name? It cuts through everything, doesn't it? And I turned round and there was Mark standing behind me talking to someone. Can't remember who he was talking to. And actually, I promise I genuinely didn't hear what he'd been saying about me. But he was speaking to someone about me and he was speaking well of me complimenting me, building me up, not knowing that I was there, not knowing that I could hear, he was choosing to speak well of me. And when I heard this, when I realized this, when this was fed back to me, I felt loved. How often is it when you overhear something, you only overhear the negatives? You only overhear the things that you wish you'd never heard? I felt so loved in that moment in that instance. So realistically, how can we love one another? I said to you, think about your love language. What can you do for one another? Be prepared to be showered with gifts, you know, if I love you. But how can we love one another so we experience that love? How can we love each other? And then there are practical ways that we, that we can love one another, aren't there? We each have our own individual gifts, things that we can practically do for each other. For instance, I could offer to cook for you. If you ate my cooking, you would worry not that I love you, but that I was trying to send you on to your heavenly reward a bit earlier than God had planned for you. Though to be fair, some of you here have eaten my cooking. Have you got over the ill effects yet? You're recovered. The hospital have signed you off. Good. I'm glad to hear it. I could offer to do some DIY for you, but I wouldn't know one end of a drill from the other. Could you imagine me with power tools? Lord. But rather worry in about the things that I can't do. I can focus on the things that I can do. I can talk. Boy, can I talk. And I can listen. I can crochet. And I can pray. I can write you a card. I can have a cup of tea with you and spend time with you. See, there are lots of ways that I can love you if you just stop and think about it for a bit. So one of the ways that you can love someone in this church this week. Now this is where you were, this is where I feel like I need to build up my barricades because sometimes I leave you with a question like that, don't I? To reflect on, to ponder, to take away for yourselves and to act on when you feel that God is, is leading you but not today. We're actually going to do a practical thing now, bar the doors, because love isn't a theory. Love is something that we do. And anyway, you'll have forgotten about this by September, and you'll have forgiven me by then. So in a minute, you are going to be given a piece of paper and a pen, and you're going to write your name on your bit of paper. Nothing else, just your name. And then you're going to fold your piece of paper up so it goes into a bowl that we haven't yet got from the kitchen, Adrian. <laughs> and then we're going to mix them all up. See, he's wonderful, isn't he? <laughs> How do you know that someone loves you? <laughs> and then we're going to pass the bowl around again and this time you're going to draw a name out of the bowl. And it's your mission this week, and longer if you want to, to love that person. Now, I can't make you write your name on a piece of paper. I can't make you join in. But please do. Don't opt out. 
It may be that you need help. It may be that you don't know who the person is that you, that you pull out and you need help to be introduced to them. But, you know, wouldn't it be great that that person experiences the love of God through you? Visitors, please feel free to join in. Please feel free to join in. There are ways that we can love you too, even if you're only here for one week. We can, we can send you a card. We can pray for you. We can do those things. We can still uh, do that for you, and you can for us too. So, there are lots of things you can do. Buy them a bunch of flowers, drop them a card, go out for coffee with them, invite them around yours. The list is endless. But church, let it not be a token gesture. Let it not be, oh, let's do it to shut June up and then we never have to do it again. Let it be an act of love. Let our love be seen towards each other. How can you love them? How can you go out of your way for them? How can they know that they are loved? That, and that, uh, the, how can they experience the love of God through you this week? So it should work out that you put your name in and you get a name out after we've collected everybody's name, you then get a name out. And it should work out that you have someone to bless and someone will have you. Now, it's your choice. If you pull out your husband and wife, if you pull out your husband or your wife, it's up to you whether you want to keep their name and do something extra loving this week. I'm not having any, I'm not having any, oh, but I show her I love her every day of the week. I'm not having any of that. I'm talking about if you pull out the name of your husband or your wife, you do something extra this week. Or maybe you want to put it back because you do show them that you love them every day of the week and you can draw someone else. Um, so it's up to you. If you draw your own name out, obviously it will go straight back in. Why are we doing this? I hear you cry. Why are we doing this? Because God loved us first and we need to learn to love each other. So often we're frightened of doing anything in case we get it wrong or we say we're shy or we say we don't know what to do. So for safety, we do nothing. What I'm praying is that as we bless someone this week, possibly someone we don't know, uh, possibly someone we don't speak to often, then new friendships will grow. And as we bless others, then we in turn will be blessed and loved. I know you shy people are hating this, but it is a way of causing you very shy people to actually talk to one another. We love because God loved us. I did this once before in my previous church, and I, I told you my love uh, language is giving gifts, and so I pulled someone's name out, and um, bless them, this poor woman, every day I turned up on their doorstep with just a small gift, but every single day, so it would be like a bunch of flowers or a, um, one of these mindful colouring books or something like that, just a small gift. And by about by the fourth day, she said, my neighbours are going to be talking, the pastor's on my doorstep every day, they're going to be wondering what I'm up to, you know, it's like... <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> so yeah, how do you, what are your languages? How can you show the love of God? How can you, so that person whose name is on your piece of paper, how can you make sure this week that they experience the love of God through you? Okay, how are we? Has everybody got a name yet? Some of you are going to need help, obviously. You're going to have to have to be pointed out who people are. Isn't this a fantastic way of getting to know one another? You can see why I'm doing this on the last week, Richard, before I'm off now to September. They can't have a go at me. I'm not here to have a go at. Address all complaints to Jenny. <laughs> She's not here. She, she won't mind. She won't mind. I'll just tell her I've volunteered her. Yes, you know where I live. Live there. What, what? Yeah, we've, yes, 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 yes. Is the, is the bowl now empty? Excellent, right. So everyone has, a, everyone that is joining in, everyone that wants one has got a name now, right? Before we sing our final song, new one last thing that you're going to hate. Go and find the person on your paper. Go and introduce yourself if you don't know them well. Go and talk to them. Bear in mind, you were going to be finding them. They're going to be trying to find someone else. So it could all get a bit messy. But love is messy, isn't it? It just is. 
So go and find the person so that they know you are going to be loving them this week. Go and find that person. If you don't know who anybody is, guys, help our new people to figure out who's who.